I think you're going to really like our tour of the two lives of Charlemagne. We have two small texts put together. One is written by Einhard. The other is written by Notger the Stammerer. Uh, one is written by, uh, well, one by Einhard. He is a trusted advisor of Charlemagne. And so he is writing right at the time, right after the death of Charlemagne to record what he himself remembers. Notger is writing decades after the death of Charlemagne, as history begins to record the falling apart of the Carolingian Empire, and he is particularly interested in writing about the piety of Charlemagne and his wars and military exploits. The Carolingian Empire starts with Pepin being crowned king of the Franks in 751. Pepin is the one who, in his military exploits, won land for the Pope and donated it to him, what became the Papal States. Charlemagne begins to reign in 768, has uh, extensive campaigns into Italy on behalf of the Pope, uh, a campaign into Spain, um, and that one was a little rough on the way out. He, he lost his rear guard uh, at the hands of the Basques, and so he went in and fortified with what's something called the Spanish March, but just below the Pyrenees Mountains, the edge between the lands that would be France and the lands that would be Spain, um, he fortified that in, to, in order to protect his empire from uh, further, further abuse. Um, he conquered the Bavarians in 800. We're going to talk about it in a minute. He was crowned emperor. Uh, finally, he got the Saxons under control in 804. And uh, then he dies in 814. His son begins to reign. and uh, But no matter how uh, good an emperor might be, uh, you couldn't live up to the personality and the, the loyalty that Charlemagne was able to engender. The kingdom was too big uh, and too diverse to be held together except by the personality of a Charlemagne. And so the kingdom begins to fall into, into ruins, and uh, the Treaty of Verdun finally divides the lands of the Carolingian Empire. Um, Einhard shows his prejudice a little bit in that battle for uh, against the Saxons. Uh, listen to the way he describes the people whom they are fighting. No war ever undertaken by the Frank nation was carried on with such persistence and bitterness or cost so much labor, because the Saxons, like almost all the tribes of Germany, were a fierce people, given to the worship of devils, hostile to our religion, and did not consider it dishonorable to transgress and violate all law, human and divine. So there you go, the, the prejudices of an Einhard in the midst of our book on Charlemagne. Einhard will go on to say that... Uh, it is a very interesting coronation that we have. Charlemagne had traveled to the aid of Leo III, and while he was in Rome, he went to pray, as the story goes, uh, before the tomb of St. Peter, and the emperor came and put the crown, or the, the pope, Pope Leo III, came and put the crown on his head and announced him the emperor of the Roman Empire. Einhard says, at first, Charlemagne had such an aversion that he declared that he would not have set foot in the church that day that they were conferred, although it was a great feast day if he had foreseen the design of the Pope. So it may have been Leo III's secret intention. It may have been something that Charlemagne had wanted to have happen. Uh, but it's an odd story that comes out of it. But it does put the Carolingian Empire sort of on an equal footing with the Byzantine Empire and gives gives a new level of balance to uh, the political fortunes of Europe. So just an odd coronation. We said that Einhard is a primary source. Notker is a secondary source. He's a little bit after the, the death of Charlemagne and the coming to the end of the Carolingian Empire. So there's a little bit of slippage in what we might call historical accuracy. Uh, Notker already seeing and remembering with great fondness what once was, and Charlemagne is on his way to becoming a legendary figure. 
This is good point, time to point out that tertiary sources are textbooks, and that means that they are perhaps most open to bias, and in my mind, sometimes they suck all the fun out of history. So you will enjoy Einhard and Notker, like I did, I think much more than you might a textbook that tells you about them. So there's my, my thought. Always go for the primary source when you can. One of the things that we would be um, remiss not to talk about is the influence of Alcuin on the life of Charlemagne. Alcuin becomes Charlemagne's tutor, and Alcuin was himself uh, tutored by the Venerable Bede. And so uh, Bede tutors Alcuin, Alcuin tutors, Char tutors Charlemagne, and then together they have a desire to spread education throughout the Frankish kingdom, the Carolingian Empire. Um, what Alcuin uh, envisioned was a chain. He starts a chain of pupils who become masters, and it begins to spread across Europe, um, across the lands of Europe, and down through the generations, so that we're impacted for a thousand years by Alcuin's vision of what could come. Um, he wanted universities, schools, academies, even houses with seats in it for children to be taught in. And that was the educational program that was inaugurated by Charlemagne and the Monk of York. And that would continue to ripple on for generations. One of the things we're extremely grateful for, for Charlemagne, was the creation of scriptorums, which were places that copied Roman Greek works as well as scripture, so that we and they may well be responsible for a lot of the things that we've been able to read because a Carolingian monk um, worked to um, save those things for future generations. Alcuin and Charlemagne had a pretty ambitious plan for what education could look like. And uh, this is from a letter from Alcuin to Charlemagne talking about what that vision of education ought to be look look like. And I wanted to point it out because Alcuin will take us back to the seven liberal arts, the trivium, the grammar, the dialectic, the rhetoric stage, and then the quadrivium as well, those pr more practical arts like uh, arithmetic and geometry and music and astronomy, the four parts of the quadrivium, and then you put philosophy and theology on top of that, and you have a great education. So listen to how um, Alcuin describes their ambitious plan. If your intentions are carried out, Charlemagne, it may be that a new Athens will arise in France, and an Athens fairer than that of old. For our Athens, ennobled by the teaching of Christ, will surpass the wisdom of the academy. The old Athens had all only the wisdom of Plato to instruct it, yet even so it flourished by the seven liberal arts. But our Athens will be enriched by the sevenfold gift of the Holy Spirit, and will therefore surpass all the dignity of earthly wisdom. Isn't that cool? What a great vision of what education can be. And I'm going to close with a story from Notger the Stammerer about Charlemagne's educational plans. There is a, a story that he puts in here of collecting middle age and children even from very poor homes and offering to give them an education under a man named Clement and then taking the children of the nobility and putting them in the classroom as well and beginning to teach them. Charlemagne goes off to war and when he comes back he will, like the Christ, when he comes back and he divides us into sheep and goats, uh, Charlemagne will come back and ask for an accounting of the education that they got. And here's the story that Notker tells. When after a long absence, Charlemagne returned to Gaul with a series of victories to his credit, he ordered the boys whom he had entrusted to Clement's care to visit him and present to him their prose writings and their poems. Those of middle-class parentage and from very poor homes brought excellent compositions, 
adorned more than he could even have hoped with all the subtle refinements of knowledge. But the children of noble parents presented work which was poor and full of stupidity. Then Charlemagne, imitating in his great wisdom the justice of the eternal judge, placed those who had worked well on his right hand and said to them, My children, I am grateful to you, for you have tried your very hardest to carry out my commands and to learn everything which will be of use to you. Continue to study hard and to strive for perfection, and I will give you bishoprics and fine monasteries, and you will always be honored in my sight. Then he turned with great severity to those on his left with a frown and a fiery gl glance, which seemed to pierce their consciences, and scornfully thundered out these frightening words. But you, young nobles, you, the pleasure-loving and dandified sons of my leaders, who trust in your high birth and your wealth and care not a straw for my command or for your own advancement, you have neglected the pursuit of learning and have indulged yourself in time-wasting follies and in this childish sport of fine living and idleness. When he had said this, he turned his august head and raised his unconquered right hand toward the heavens and thundered forth an oath against them. By the king of heaven, I think nothing of your nobility and your fine looks. Others can admire you for these things if they wish. Know this for certain, unless you immediately make up for your previous idleness by diligent study, you will never receive anything worth having from Charlemagne. Isn't that a great picture? Great warning, but also great encouragement to students today because you have a choice. Right? You can ride on the coattails of parents, however long or short they are, or you have within you, no matter how, what your economic status is, you have within you to be able to create something great. And so Charlemagne recognizes it's not where you start, but it's the passion with which you pursue education in the sevenfold gift of the Holy Spirit um, that can take you to all kinds of places that you would have never dreamed. So with that, we'll let uh, Charlemagne go. Thanks for hanging out.